How do you react when someone uses a pitch on you? Are you just trying to sell me? Like, you're just trying to sell me stuff? Whether it's good or not, they just try to make money off of me. Okay, so it's more for them than for you? Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on pitches? Because that's a, a typical feeling is that when someone pitches you, we don't necessarily like it and we don't necessarily respond positively. And what we're talking about is the art of pitching, which is a bit of a contradiction. Because it's, so, it's more interesting to do the pitching than to be the person who is pitched at. And so when, when someone is pitching at us, then we tend to be defensive. We've got our, our guard there. We're trying to protect ourselves because we know something's coming and it may not be the ideal thing for us. And that makes it that much more difficult to get our message across because we're very susceptible to or very sensitive to things that are a little bit off nowadays. And so the heart, so the art of the pitch really starts with the heart of the pitch. And when you're pitching, you're really pitching one thing, one thing only, and that is yourself. You're basically trying to get people to, to get involved with you and then through extension, that leads to them getting involved with whatever you're presenting. And lasting success, because a pitch can also be seen as a one-time thing where you're after something, you're trying to do something, get your result. But lasting success comes from building relationships with other people. And that is not as quick as just doing a pitch and trying to get a sale, but that's something that actually helps you over the longer term. And a key part of doing a pitch is learning how to do networking first. Because the way you start your pitching is actually well in advance, as far in advance as you can, so that when you are seeing the people, they're already predisposed to you and to be receptive to the ideas that you're sharing with them. And this is one of the things that I wish I knew earlier, but you can always learn even at my age. So imagine this, you've got a corner office in downtown Toronto, working for a multi-billion dollar company. And corner office, nice view, all those things. And what's going to happen is that your boss is about to retire and he's the only senior vice president in the company. And so that would suggest that there would be lots of opportunities opened up for you once your boss finally retires. The only problem is that you're getting all set to put your feet up on the desk, etc. Uh, and so this is basically the situation I was in back in 2004. Uh, I'm an actuary by training and I was developing products for an insurance company and the future looked really wonderful, but then what happened is the company vanished. It got merged into another one and so I had my 10 staff and then they didn't have jobs anymore. In my case I was kept on, but I lost my corner office which was so tragic. It's one of those things that you want and uh, then you end up losing it. And I was spared, but I wondered what would happen next time? Because it's fine if something happens to you today and you didn't really prepare for it, but if the same thing happens five years later and you're no better prepared then than you are now, then in a sense you've wasted those five years. And some of the things we'll be talking about, you can start now. I, I was talking to some students here last month on the topic of beyond branding, building trust. And one of the students, I guess he's in the MBA program, uh, got some feedback from me and he doesn't plan to implement anything until he graduates, which is a couple of years away, which is in essence wasting a couple of years of time. So I was concerned about what would happen next time. And I decided that the key thing would be that would be a good way to provide insurance of sorts would be to become known by strangers. Because if you can do things where people who don't even know you get to know you, then that creates opportunities for you. And in my case, this is back in 2007, I figured that the way to get known by strangers was by blogging. And back in those days, it was still relatively new, especially in the insurance world. And so I started doing that, and I basically wrote about insurance and other things. So you'd be, as you know with blogging, you can have any sort of niche and there'll be some people who will read this stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy that way. And things just build over time. And then I also decided that I would learn to network. And that was something I had never really done because I was working in head offices and there was really no need to do that, or so I thought. 
But I figure that if you can do things to get known by others, that would be good. But if you're trying to network, it's very difficult if you're introverted. It's very difficult if you don't know how. And I wasn't really sure how to proceed, so in my normal fashion, I just started learning about networking. And that was a little disappointing because when you look at the references that people tell you to look at for networking, they're so depressing. They're so self-serving. So each one has some good points, but are you really trying to win people? Like, is it some sort of a game that, hey, I'm winning, I've got more people on my side? Uh, this one is pretty entertaining. That guy is a little bit on the arrogant side. He's just like talking about himself. So apart from a title of the book, it was not really something I found very worthwhile. Most of the advice was obvious or self-serving. So for instance, one of the things that you'll be told is that you should give before you ask. But be sure to ask. Right? So it's just a manipulative strategy. And that didn't seem like the right way of doing things. And then you'd always have these entertaining stories that would be similar to what you'd see in Get Rich Quick Schemes. So Pat met this stranger, and all of a sudden, life changed, and now spends time just flying from villa to villa around the world. Those sorts of things. And if you want to know how, then here's a program that you can buy. Just put your money here, and you'll be potentially as good sometime in the future. Maybe those ideas worked at the time those books were written in the past, but the world has changed fundamentally. And what happened is in the past, networks used to be hidden in private Rolodexes. And power came from hiding things. So you were the only one who had access to these people. If someone wanted access, they had to come through you. Well, and just in case you don't know, because this is a fairly young audience, uh, this is called a telephone, and they used to have wires. <laughs> they used to be connected to walls. It's, it's true. You can look it up. That's what they used to do with those things. And, and so it was a little odd, because what happens now is that transparency and connectedness and openness is what brings value. And so if you look at the old networking techniques, which were also the old techniques used for pitching, they don't work so well anymore, because we have all this transparency. What's valuable is what's visible. And that includes networks. And so what I would do is I would search up the, or I would look up these experts to see, or like these networking experts, to see what was being said about them. And I saw that what they were saying on stage was not consistent with what they were doing in real life. So they'd be talking about all this giving and sharing and all this stuff. And you'd see that they didn't do any of that. Apart from selling what they had, it didn't seem that they were congruent with what they were saying. And that chasm is something that can destroy trust. And in the past, you wouldn't really have known. You would have seen these people presenting themselves in a particular way, just as you might present yourself when you're doing a pitch. But now it's very easy to look someone up and see what they actually are. And that's something you want to be careful of when you're doing pitching or other networking. And so I was trying to figure out what the keys are to networking today. And I discovered that there were three. The first is to act like a host. The second is to stay visible. And the third is to nurture. And those very three, those same very three steps work ideally for pitching, too. And we'll examine each. So in terms of acting like a host, uh, some people think this is a really key point. It's kind of like an eye-opener. And maybe some of you will feel that way, too. As a host, your job is to make sure that other people are enjoying the event and benefiting from it. So even the people who are in the quarters, introverted ones, etc., if you're the host, it's your job to make sure that they're happy. And when you're the host, you have permission to talk to anyone. In fact, you've got the responsibility to talk to people. So even if you're, I was just at an event last night, and so all these people, I don't really know where they are, who they are, they're all engineers. And so I don't even want to talk to them. But I'm there, and so <laughs> I was volunteering. Um, but I'm there, and so I need to do something. And then, so if you pretend that you're the host, you go out to them and you ask them if they're enjoying the experience, how they got there, those sorts of things. Then it helps make them more comfortable. And it also gets you involved with people rather than just being on the sidelines. Now, Toastmasters is very key in helping with some of these things. So, are, like, how many of you are members of this club right now? Okay, so most of you are just are just experiencing Toastmasters to see whether you want to join. Okay, I've been in Toastmasters for about three years, 
And you'll find that a lot of these things that tie in with pitching and networking also tie in very well with Toastmasters because it's essential that you practice. And in Toastmasters, what you'll see when you come to a normal meeting is that you get the opportunity for really good feedback from people who are really just here to support you. Because outside this room, you'll find that people will give you feedback, but it's not really very useful. It's not coming from people who are trained to give valuable feedback. And so I would encourage you to come back to this club more than once. I'm assuming that people can come back for free. And I don't know if you get pizza every time, but you get the opportunity to, to learn. And so what happens is small talk builds rapport, and that leads to big talk. And one of the things you learn in Toastmasters are techniques to start small talk. Now, because of me speaking here, you're not doing table topics today. But that's an example where uh, you talk for about a minute about something that you pull randomly from a jar that you know nothing about. Doesn't make any sense, because in real life, no one would ask you to talk about something you knew nothing about. But you get to practice. And when you can talk about something you know nothing about, you can definitely talk about things that you do know about. And that's a very, that you might find is the most valuable part of Toastmasters in the, in the regular meetings that you have. So when you're meeting people, you can ask questions that are general. So you can ask them, well, okay, how did you find out about Ryerson Toastmasters? Like the website, did someone tell you? So that's a good conversation starter. Everyone is here for some reason. and. They're here to speak also, so there's really no drawback in asking something like that. You can ask event-specific things. So, which I kind of gave in the first example. Uh, so, you're asking specifically about Toastmasters, if you've been here before, what do you know about it, etc. And then you can also ask universal questions. I don't know if you've read Dan Pink's new book, To Sell as Human, but in that he suggests one question that you can ask virtually everyone you meet and they will interpret it whatever way they want, and it's fascinating how people will respond. And the question is, where are you from? Some people will say, well, I'm from Etobicoke. Some people will say, well, I'm from India. Or some people will say, well, I'm from this company. It's really how they identify themselves, but it doesn't really matter what they say. The point is they said something that was non-threatening, but then it can lead to more conversations. So you'll learn a lot of those sorts of things in Toastmasters. And if you want to get the maximum benefits, what you want to do is join the organizing committee. Because what happens then is you get to know the other organizers. And then that's a tighter group of people, and you get known by them. And that's really key, because you can come to a large group like this, and it can take you a long time to, to get to know people. But if you're part of the volunteer team that's running this group, then that gives you advantages. There's really no downside to it. And then people also want to be involved with you. Now, something that TEDx Toronto did this year for the first time, I don't think TEDx Ryerson is doing it this year, but maybe next year, is they came up with the concept of ambassadors. And so an ambassador is someone who's gone to the events in the past and whose job it is, this is acting like a host, is to talk to other people there, especially new people, to make sure that they understand the experience and you, and you get back to answer questions. And so with something like this, this badge, it gives you the right to go and talk to anyone. And it raises questions because everyone else gets badges that are black on white. And so, okay, what do you have that's different? So there are little things like that that can also help you, but the key it would, is to start acting like the host, even though you aren't. And you'll find that really good things start happening when you do that. The second thing, is to stay visible. And this one is pretty important, too. Because first impressions, we're, we're told, I don't know what your first impressions of me are today, but the fact is first impressions aren't a big deal anymore. You, well, like you keep being told that first impressions are so, so key. But it doesn't matter as much as you staying in touch with people. I mean, if you watch <coughs> movies, the romantic ones, which my wife makes me watch sometimes, I mean. They don't always hit it off right in the beginning, right? But they keep at it. So if it happens in movies, maybe it happens in real life too. And so it's really important to be able to follow up because if you don't, then people will forget about you. And you may find that the 20th impression is much more important than the first impression or the second impression. And the 50th impression is that much more important than the 20th. 
all these things build on themselves. And that's something that people don't always seem to get. Because, so you'll find that there are gems, but in the beginning you wouldn't have known that this is a person who can be helpful to you or someone you want to know. But as you spend time getting to know them, or as they spend time getting to know you, then you discover some of these things over time. Now, meeting people in person is ideal, but it's not always practical. But back in my day, that's about the only thing we had. You had to actually meet people face to face. But now we have all this technology. So you can phone people or text them depending on what they prefer. Uh, you can use social networks to stay in touch. So you've got all these additional tools. And what I find, I, I don't know, somehow I feel like a really old person today, is that when you talk to old people, they know about strategies, but they don't know how to use any of the tools. Oh, I don't know how to change my signature on my email. It always says, sent from my iPhone. And you find young people know how to use all the tools, but they haven't developed strategies. And so it's, it's a little odd that both groups could benefit probably from talking to one another. And an ideal place for you to build your network is on LinkedIn. And again, this is because it's really important to have your network visible today, and that's an ideal spot. So for instance, when you're meeting someone, maybe outside of this room, you could ask them if they're on LinkedIn. And chances are they will, and will be there, or if they're not, you can tell them why it's a good idea to be on there, and then ask them if they'd like to connect with you. And then connect with them over the next couple of days, and now they're part of your network. Now when someone is part of your network, then your responsibility is to be a steward, to protect them, to help them, to nurture them. You're not really there to take advantage of them. And you'll see that when it comes to pitching, this is really key too, because we're judged by the company we keep. And so when you're doing your pitch to someone who's never seen you before, you just look like a nobody. But when they see, they check you on LinkedIn and they see you're connected to this person and that person. And so for instance, I don't know what you think of my talk today, but after I'm done, I can go to LinkedIn and say, I spoke at TEDx Ryerson, right? Sorry, not TEDx Ryerson, I can go something else. Uh, I spoke at uh, Ryerson Toastmasters, right? And so that'll sound impressive to people because they weren't here and they didn't realize how it actually went. But that will actually add to what I've done in the past. So uh, LinkedIn is a really good spot for you to connect. Now when you're connecting, and students have a really good opportunity, because you have a halo effect right now because you're not in the working world, so you can connect to almost anyone as long as you have a good reason. They're not going to feel threatened by you. It would be mean to not connect to a student who genuinely wants to connect. I mean, there'll be some people who won't, but when you start working, and you start connecting to people, then it almost looks like a pitch. Okay, if this person wants to connect to me, the next thing they'll want to do is look for a job. Right? But if you've already planted those seeds, you, you're on LinkedIn, you're in some of the same groups as some of these people, maybe you're following them on Twitter, you've started building that relationship. And when you're pitching, sometimes you don't know who to pitch to. And you'll find that what's really key is not so much the people you know directly, but the people that they know. And as you build your network, you, have, so you simply have more options. Now, it's very tempting to try and connect to celebrities, so like all these famous people who are well known. And for the most part, they don't have any interest in you. So connecting with them won't really lead to much. You want to connect to people who are on the go and are climbers, maybe people like you, maybe people who are a little more advanced. Because what will happen is maybe they're not at the top of a company today, but well, maybe not in five years, but over time they'll be rising in their careers. And so when you have a greater need for certain things, you'll find that you've built connections with people who aren't retired because the celebrities are older generally and they won't be there. So it's, and also it's much easier to connect to non-celebrity type people. So for instance, if you wanted to connect to me on LinkedIn, then I would probably connect to you if you just reminded me how we met. Right? Because I'm not important, so for me it's no big deal, but if you have some really important speakers here, then I might say that they would, but they probably would not. And the last part is to nurture. And this again ties in very well with pitching, because you may have a pitch and it doesn't go so well, or it's just the wrong timing. That doesn't mean that you want to lose that relationship, 
because you may find there are opportunities sometime in the future, but you won't have those opportunities unless you maintain contact. If the only time someone hears from you is when you want something, then it doesn't work so well. It's Movember right now. I don't know if this happened to you. I get an email from someone who never sends me emails and wants donations. Not even a mail, like she's supporting men in her life. And okay, fine, but that doesn't work so well if that's the only time I've heard from that person because our guard is up when we hear these pitches and there's really nothing invested in that relationship to have nurtured it. So when your network is visible and you help them in a visible way, what you're doing is you're creating a digital tapestry. So when someone looks you up online, they'll see all these different things that you've done. So if you're going and you're pitching, one of the other things that you learn in Toastmasters is there's often someone in the group who is the crutch word counter, and they will pay attention to words that you keep repeating that you shouldn't. In my case, I've been using so a lot. Many people tend to use ah a lot. My crutch word tends to be so, and as I play this back later, I'll be able to uh, cringe at how many times I've said that. But that's one of the other side benefits of Toastmasters is you become a lot more sensitive to speech things that you're doing that are not quite the way you want them to be. And, and so, see, now you're more aware of it too. I could say I did that on purpose, but you know that wouldn't be true. Networking is a lot like gardening. You're planting seeds of unknown quality. You don't really know what's going to grow, but you need to nurture and be patient with with the different things that you're doing. And the same thing happens when you're pitching, because when you suppose someone, and I guess there's all sorts of pitching, but say the, the type where you're trying to get money for a business, venture capital or something along those lines, there'll be some of those things that succeed and other ones that fail. And from the viewpoint of the person investing, they're investing without necessarily knowing the outcome, right? And so some will work out, some will not, and that's okay from their point of view, as long as they get enough that are the right way. The same thing happens with your networking. When you're investing in different people, some you'll find end up being very helpful to you, and others perhaps not so much. And you really can't tell what will be valuable, and that's why it's good to have diversity. Now, one of the issues I had with the engineers I saw yesterday is I don't see them going to other events. They just seem to go to engineering events. And I was at one. I don't know why you'd go a second time. But for them, it's probably something that they enjoy. But they would get a lot more benefits by connecting to people outside of that group. I mean, they can still go to their events, but they can go to other ones also. And that way, they'd be, ex they'd be extending the diversity in their network. And you never know who knows who, and you never know what you need at any particular time. And it's good to plant those seeds. Now, as a steward, what you're doing is you're doing little things to help your network grow. In the beginning, what you start with will look very crude, but as you keep at it, and I hear I'm talking about your digital tapestry, the things that you're doing that are visible online, you'll create something that's quite remarkable. Now, you can't do this in a day, and when you're starting off, you'll have something that doesn't really look like anything, but when you keep at it, you'll get results. And this is where many people run into challenges. They lack the consistency to keep sticking at boring things. You may have heard of the 10,000 hour rule where basically it says that to get somewhere you have to do really boring things like practice, whether you want to be a really good musician or a hockey player, whatever you want to do, uh, the idea is that it takes a long, long time to get there. Now you may think that today it's all different and you don't need to practice because things are moving so fast, but you can be working on building portable skills so you may not necessarily be using the same programming languages that you're learning today, but you're acquiring the ability to keep learning and you're acquiring different skills to help you so that whatever happens in the future, you're resilient and can adapt to it. Now, people will connect to you for different reasons and you'll connect to people for different reasons too. And sometimes people may look self-serving at the moment, but you still may want to connect to them because maybe you can help them by making them aware that the way they're behaving isn't really in their best interests. So there are a lot of different things that you can do to help your network grow over time. And the same techniques work when you're doing your pitches. 
Now, just wanted to give you an overview of some of those networking ideas, and we can look at how they work in the context of, of uh, pitching. Now, questions, comments? Because the real benefit in a group is when you have a discussion. If it's just me talking, I could just record a YouTube video. You could stay at home. It would be just as good. You could just leave your comments at the bottom. <laughs> Does any of this make sense? Okay, any, yes? I just have a comment. I want to um, talk about the nurture section of it all. I think that that can relate to not necessarily just LinkedIn and networking like socially, but with our everyday interactions with people. Whereas if you don't communicate with somebody and the moment they want something, they, they try to get in contact with you, it kind of relates back to what you were saying about LinkedIn. So it's not only relatable within social networks for an everyday life as well. So it's something that we can take from our experiences and kind of put up there as well. So. Yes, definitely. I was just giving some examples, but yes, what you do in person is very powerful too. The problem with things you do in person is that who else knows? So you may do something really amazing for this person over here. That person knows, but no one else does. So still do those things, but if you can do something where it leaves a trace somewhere online, then it adds to what you're doing. So for instance, some of the things I blog about are things that I'm involved with in my real life. And so I've done something to help someone, and uh, that's fine, they're, they're dealt with. But if I create a blog post, and now I'm helping more people, and I'm getting extra mileage out of what I did in that situation. And so in-person is ideal, but if you want to create a stronger first impression, and when you're pitching to someone, you may not have ever met them before. But if you've done, so maybe you've done all these really amazing things in your personal life that no one else knows about, it, may look to them like you haven't done anything, which isn't really fair. So perhaps taking a little bit of that time to create things that show is also worthwhile. Other comments? Yes? Yeah, I'm getting curious. Uh, with the host mentality, which I think is a great idea, but how do you avoid uh, seeming domineering, especially when you're not the de facto host, but you still have carried this mentality with you? How do you make it seem like you're not imposing yourself? others. Okay, that was one that I struggle with too, but if you try it, you find out it works out, because you're doing it for their benefit. You're not doing it to pretend that, hey, I'm running this club today. You're just there to help. If someone has a question, then you can help them or say, well, the pizza's over here. There are lots of little things that, that you can do, and sometimes just talking to someone is all they need, because they're there, but they don't really know how to start a conversation. Your Toastmasters, maybe you, you're a lot more comfortable with that. But there'll be little things that you can do. And when you're, when you're busy doing things, then the time passes more quickly and you start getting known. So you're do, when you're doing something with a good intent, it tends to work out. So maybe just try it and you'll see that it works pretty well. Other comments? Yeah, I think along the lines of that, I think a lot of people are are very self-conscious of like what you said about like being so dominant but at the end like I could speak for myself but I wouldn't be self-conscious about that but at the same time I would love if someone would approach me and I think most people are like that so. Mm -hmm. so maybe what you can do in a situation like that is if you want to add more pressure to yourself and get more authority is join the organization and then have an assigned role okay so your job is to greet people your job is this you're an ambassador in that case, you don't have any excuses because it's actually your job. Right? So, like if I'm told that I'm, I'm speaking here today, well, okay, well, I have to speak. I can't say I don't really want to or I'm feeling tired or I'm not feeling good. Like all those things don't really matter because there are, there are often things that are going on in the background of people's lives. I'm not saying they are in my case, but <laughs> you still have to play that role. And sometimes just having the mask, so you're, say, an assistant post then you're just doing things to help people enjoy the experience. So today, like I, I'm a guest at your club, and I know some of the goals of your club would be to get more members. So you'll notice that I keep talking about how amazing Toastmasters is. Now, if you join the club, you'd find out that it's actually not true, but I wouldn't be here, and in that case, it wouldn't matter. I would have helped them in attracting people. Actually, I'm joking. You'd find it's really amazing. But I understand the objectives of the organizers, 
And so I'm working towards those also, even though I may have different goals of my own. One final comment? Yes? Can you talk like uh, the place is big emphasis on the importance of the follow up? Like, are you, are you always pitching? Like, pitching almost seems like it should be genuine. Like, it's almost kind of just like regular dialogue. With you, but are you always pitching? Because, like, if things don't go well in one pitch, it's almost just like, Yes, if you don't get the outcome that you want, it means that you didn't make a convincing enough case. Uh, when I was in the corporate world, I had this thing where I always wanted to get my computer upgraded as soon as I could. And so the normal cycle was three or four years, and I wanted to be upgraded every one or two years. And the IT department doesn't like giving, around, giving computers out, but you know that they're buying computers all the time. And so how does, from their point of view, it doesn't matter if they give it to you or they give it to someone who actually needs it. But if you come up with a good argument, so as an actuary, you can always come up with stuff that you need faster processing or, or your disk drive is too slow or too small. But I would find other, so in my case, I'd generally be able to get the upgrades or the things that I wanted. Other people would try and do the same thing and they would find that they didn't get the result. But that was really because they didn't make the right business case. Another way of looking at pitching, which may be a little more palatable, because generally when you think of a pitch, it does have a lot of negative connotations, is think of a lighter version of a pitch as being a way to influence people. So whenever you're doing things, you're trying to influence people to do certain things. So today, maybe not subtly enough, I'm trying to influence you or encourage you to come back to the club and hopefully join. And that's, so that's part of my mandate. Now, if I just said that, all of you come back next week or two weeks, whatever, it doesn't work. But I can plant the little things here and there to help lead to, to maybe get you thinking about that as one of the goals. So if you think of these little things, so when you think of a pitch, it tends to be something big and there's all this pressure, etc. But something as little as, or as simple as adding someone to your network is a form of a pitch. So for instance, if I want to connect to you, then I basically need to convince you that it's worth your time. Now, that's a pretty small ask. But when you do start doing small asks, then you feel more comfortable doing bigger asks. And you find that that practice helps you get better. And so for instance, one of the things that you can start doing, say if you're on Twitter, uh, see what you can do to get 100 followers. I mean, something like, without following a thousand people, because that would probably do it, but something as simple as that, or to see if a total stranger will connect to you on LinkedIn. Because that's an experience that tests your copywriting skills. You're contacting a stranger, you're giving them some plausible reason why they might want to connect to you. And if you're able to do that, then that's effective too. So we've got all these opportunities where we can keep practicing and building our skills. And so maybe think of pitching as small forms of influence and the effects build over time and your confidence also builds. So the speech, see, so again, the, the topic that I'm covering today is one that I've never covered before. But I'm hoping it comes across as relatively fluid and I'm including things about this club, et cetera, because I understand the context where you, a lot of you are just guests, et cetera. And the reason I can do that, because in the past, like I'm someone who couldn't, back in the days when phones had cords, I could not phone someone without having notes first. Right? So I'd have to write down my notes, this is what I'll say to the person, I'd call at lunchtime or after work because I knew they wouldn't be there, I'd get their voicemail, I'd be able to re-record it three or four times until it was half decent, and that's where I started. And if you look at where I am today, I hope you would agree that there's been some progression. And I had all these things about my body language and all that. But you tend to just work on these little things and they get better over time. Now, you end up getting a lot of rewards when you start doing some of these simple things. And it's ideal to start this relatively early on. In my case, what happened, so when my boss was to retire was about 2004. Then five years later, they told you that I wanted to be prepared five years later in case something happened. Uh, the corporate world decided that they could do without my services. And at this point, it wasn't a panic because I had built a network. And so I told my network, hey, I'm 
uh, not working anymore. And for that month, I had all these meetings with people who just wanted to know what I wanted to do and these sorts of things. And that was because I had just been doing little things to help a lot of people. And when you create goodwill like that, then good things start happening to you. And you'd be surprised at how that can be so effective. But you just need to get started and then start doing good things. Something as simple as, uh, say you're on LinkedIn. You post one or two updates a week with links to content that you think would be of interest to your network. It doesn't matter if anyone reads it. Over time, they'll start noticing that consistency. And for instance, one of the people I met yesterday was someone important who I met some months ago. And we didn't really talk much. But then yesterday, she was talking quite a bit. And that's because it's not like we spoke in between. But now we're connected on LinkedIn. I'm at a cause that she's supporting. She keeps seeing these updates from me on a regular basis. And it's built rapport. Now, in coming here today, Muhammad and I exchanged a lot of emails. And in that process, we got to know each other a bit. Even though we've never met, like, like I, I like him. And I'm hoping <laughs> that he likes me too. But that was without actually meeting. Then you meet him, so, oh, you and that guy? And he probably felt the same about me. But we'd already started building that rapport. So the end result was I had this opportunity to uh, leave the corporate world off on my own. And it wasn't scary because I had my network. And when you have a network, they'll also endorse you for things. So these are people who essentially are giving you a 360 degree evaluation of how you are. So when you're doing a pitch, and so for instance, if I want to talk somewhere, then people will say, oh, well, a lot of people think I'm good at public speaking. Right? And that will help bring in credibility and maybe encourage an organizer to bring me in. And one of the easiest ways, now, I mean, you're students right now, so you're not known quite as much, but one of the easiest ways to get endorsements is to give endorsements. Right? So if you're giving endorsements to someone else, you don't necessarily want them to endorse you back, but your entire network sees that you're doing something generous. And then maybe someone thinks, well, actually, I was thinking that you're good at public speaking, too, and maybe I should give you an endorsement, too. So all these little things that simply require a bit of discipline and consistency can lead to good benefits over time. Now, I'll give you an example of a sample pitch for something which is really hard to pitch that I've been pitching for the last month or so. This is Financial Literacy Month. I'm sure you've all got events marked on your calendar, you're skipping classes, you're going to events, you want to learn about these things. Now, what would it take you, what would it take for you to go to an event for Financial Literacy Month? Any thoughts? Yes? Finding out what the benefit is for me. Okay, finding out the benefit for you. Any other thoughts? Yes? Something about food? Something about food? Some really good food. Some really good food. Okay. In other words, yes, yeah, so there needs to be something besides the topic, it seems. Now, when I talk to people about financial literacy, because that's something that's important to me, I want people to understand things about money more. But when I talk to people, what they say is that the topic is really boring, and if they want it to be bored, they just go to class. Why would they go somewhere else? So if you want, ah. okay. the topic is boring. It's hard to, what, what, instead of using crutch words like so, the idea is that you just Pause, you don't fill that space in with anything. If the topic is boring, then the antidote to that is to make it engaging. And how do you make it engaging? Well, why not use the format of TEDx Wireson? Basically, what you have there are short talks. So suppose, instead of having someone talking to you for an hour or two about something, you have a bunch of speakers where each one only gets 30 minutes. So 15 minutes of that is their talk, so that's like a TEDx talk. And 15 minutes, but if it's just a TEDx talk, you could just watch it on YouTube later. But the other 15 minutes are interactive Q&A. And that's a reason to be there live. Now, so in, in the period of, say, a couple of hours, you could see three or four people. There may be a particular one that you don't have any interest in, but when you look at that whole package, maybe that would be appealing. That's, that's a way to maybe deal with the boring aspect. There's another feeling that the people talking with the topics are biased because they're essentially pitching you. There's something that they're trying to sell. And the antidote to that 
is to have speakers who are objective. Now, who knows about money who is objective? Well, writers do. So if you look at, I can't stop. So again, if you look at bloggers, journalists, authors, they know a lot about money. They're not really selling money things, apart from maybe books or newspapers. They could be people who could give you advice. Maybe you would go and see someone who's, who you don't see as being biased. And then the other aspect that bothers people, if they've ever gone to anything, is they say the speakers are pretty lousy because they haven't been to Toastmasters. And if they had, then they would be really amazing. The idea there would be to have proven speakers who can show that they have skills and they've been vetted. You're not taking a risk on people that you've never seen before. And you want people who are of Toastmaster quality because they've gone through the rigor, they've practiced, they've received feedback. Because everyone who speaks seems to think that they're good, but the audiences don't necessarily feel the same way, though the audiences won't tell them that. In Toastmasters, when you do your speech, you'll get really good objective feedback on things that you can improve. And you can't get better unless someone tells you what you can improve on. And in fact, what you can do, which is what I like doing, though I didn't bring any paper here today, is I like getting feedback from the whole group as much as possible. Because if one person says, well, I didn't like the way you did this or you could have done that, that's one person's opinion. If the group generally feels the same way, then I would take that more seriously. You'll find that Toastmasters is a, a lab where you can experiment with things and get some really good suggestions. We have some issues with some boring, biased, lousy speakers. We've got some ideas to help overcome that. And the event that I created to help deal with this is called Money 50-50. And the idea there is that it has things that people want. It's got food. It's nearby. Not a lot of travel required. There's an opportunity for networking. If you ever go to a TEDx event, and there's a TEDx Ryerson event in a, well, later on this month, then you'll find that the talks are part of it, but a lot of the time is just talking to other people. There are subsidized rates for students, so they don't have to pay as much. And everyone there is a volunteer. And things are done to a Toastmaster standard, which means that things are done on time, there's proper chairing, a lot of these other things. And it gives people an opportunity to have, students an opportunity to have a break before exams. Now, when you look at those elements, then maybe financial literacy is not as boring as it would have seemed a few minutes ago. Or if I had talked about this, say, at the beginning of the presentation, well, you haven't heard anything from me, and you don't have a sense of whether you even like me or not, it probably wouldn't have been as effective either. Um, so if you're interested, you can just go to this website, money5050.com, and see who these different speakers are. And so I just wanted to give you a sense of how you could do a pitch for something that's really boring. And in my case, I've been able to get speakers who would normally, like, there were speakers bureaus, so generally you're looking at five or $10,000 a speech. Now, if you're doing an event where basically you're just trying to cover the costs at $5 or $15, depending on whether you're a student or uh, a non-student, then you can't bring in people like that. You need to convince them that they need to volunteer. And so all of those things are related to pitching, too. And some of these people I've never really met. But because of the things I've done in the past, or some of the referrals I've received, I'm able to get their attention, too. And that's simply from doing things to plant seeds. And when you're doing your pitch, then you can spend a lot of time trying to perfect what you're going to say and how you're going to dress and dealing with all the objections. And that's important too. But you're not doing a pitch every day. What you can do prior to that is little things to help build your network so that when it does come time for you to do your pitch, you've got that solid, solid foundation. Because when it comes to selling, what you're told, it's not really the logical side of our brain that helps make the decisions. It's really our hearts, that the whole process is emotional. And that's where building the relationships and 